y bienvenidos a este... Bueno, bueno, oficialmente será esta tarde cuando empiece el tercer encuentro de, de la red de geometría algebraica y singularidades. Y para entonces, bueno, ya, ya os pondré, estamos ultimando los últimos detalles, el horario, el horario completo. Y ahora, de, de momento, pues vamos a empezar con, con, con el curso que, que amablemente se ha ofrecido el, el profesor Madrid a, a darnos durante las primeras cuatro mañanas. El, el horario será básicamente que el, el, que, el que está anunciado, el, el horario de, de inicio, pues hoy, hoy a las 11, porque algunos veníais directamente de fuera, y, y el resto de días a las 9, y van a ser dos horas con un intervalo de una hora, excepto mañana, que el intervalo va a ser más breve, de media hora, porque justo, justo aquí, mañana a las 12, hay, hay otra conferencia con un título enigmático en que dice que tal vez resuelvan el problema 16 de Hilbert, y también lo van a retransmitir y entonces pues, pues mañana intentaremos terminar pronto y si alguien se quiere quedar luego a la, a la siguiente conferencia que no tiene nada que ver con la red, pues eh, estáis todos bienvenidos también. Bueno, entonces ya veis, se, se está grabando todo. Eh, de momento lo que, lo que vamos a grabar es, con toda seguridad, es el curso de Madrid y luego a cada uno de los conferenciantes le pediremos si tiene inconveniente o no, si alguien tiene inconveniente, pues, pues no pasa nada, no se le graba. Eh. Yo soy el primero que si me hubieran preguntado no estaría ahora presentando lo que están grabando que entiendo perfectamente que, que no lo queráis. Bueno, y, y eso, la información práctica, si es posible en el intervalo, pues ya tendré aquí los horarios para recordarlo, pero bueno, no quiero quitar más tiempo al profesor Maitri. So, thank you very much for, for coming, for offering you to, to be the course. Okay. So is the, rec the recording machine is all set up. My voice, you can hear my voice. I'm uh, in, intending to lecture about uh, graded rings and constructions of algebraic varieties. Uh, so I'm not doing this in a very great generality. I'm mainly interested in the cases where the graded rings are tractable. In other words, you can uh, really work with them. You can really construct them. <coughs> and um, so together with construction of algebraic varieties, there is classification. So sometimes the methods will prove that algebraic varieties exist, or divide them up into different classes, or in some cases prove that they don't exist. Okay, so uh, I, I, I think I have to assume background in at least undergraduate algebra. So graded ring means R is direct sum Rn, n greater than or equal to zero, and Rn Times, so if I do Rn1 times Rn2, this is contained in Rn1 plus N2. <coughs> yes, uh, and uh, there'll be other assumptions. So, so usually, I mean, in in matters of substance, usually uh, are zero is a field, and let's say the field is C. So if you're interested in number theory, or if you're interested in real geometry, or if you're interested in geometry over a function field, then I assume that you know what you have to do to change this. This is, this is just for short, just a, an abbreviation. We can work over any field, but uh, some things are easier here. And usually Rn is dimension uh, Pn of R is less than infinity. <coughs> so uh, uh, if I start off with an algebraic variety x and then plus 
extra some extra data then I'm going to get a, a, a finite dimensional vector space. So this data might be a divisor, or it might be a sheaf, or it might be something else. Let's not, let me not, uh, I'm just giving a very brief introduction here. So here I'm going data depending on n. Right, if I try to make this precise, it won't be general enough for later purposes. So uh, this might be a fixer divisor D, and I, I'm taking N D. Or it might be I'm taking a sheaf L, and I'm taking something like L tensor N, or L etc. Yes, and then maybe this is L of nd, so this is riemann roch space, or maybe it's L of uh, sheaf L to the power of n, etc. Yes, and uh, I want these things, whatever the data is here, is supposed to, these things are supposed to multiply together according to this rule. Yes. And so we can use this to make different constructions. So uh, uh, some of what I'm going to say is sort of best understood in terms of uh, just working with examples. So let me uh, let me give an example where you know this is you can understand what's happening, why we're doing it, and you can understand that it leads to calculations that are not completely trivial, and it also leads to uh, results. So I want to talk about C, a curve of genus 3, and I want to talk about the canonical fast of C. So I'm going to talk about the, be the theoretical foundations of riemann roch later in today's talk, in this first talk. But at the moment, let's just assume everybody knows a curve has a canonical class. So if I look at H0 of Kc, well, this is the same thing as riemann roch space of Kc. This is three-dimensional, and so it has a three-dimensional vector space, so it has a basis, X0, X1, X2. Yes, and I can use this basis to do phi kc from c into uh, p2. p2 is just with coordinates x0, x1, x2. And this, uh, uh, <coughs> so this is the rational map defined by point p and c maps to ratio x naught at p, x1 at p, x2 at p. Yes. So uh, this is a divisor class, or this is a, a <coughs> uh, you can think of this as a line bundle. So a section of it uh, it doesn't make sense to ask for the value of a section. However, at any, it, it so happens at any point P, one of these things bases uh, the line bundle or the divisor class, and the ratio between these is a well-defined function. I'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. So this is a morphism and on P2, I have this sheaf, OP2 of 1. This is the sheaf that has x0, x1, x2 as its uh, uh, sections, its global sections. And then OC of KC 
is isomorphic to the pullback of OP2. Yeah. So uh, together with knowing that this is three-dimensional, we know that the degree of Kc is 2d minus 2 is 4. And I'll do this in quite a lot more generality later in today in this first lecture. Yes, and so uh, I'm taking the pullback of the line bundle on P2, which is P2, and the lines in P2, so this is, uh, you know, Xi equals zero, or some linear form in Xi equals zero. And when I pull this back, I get a section of a sheaf that has four zeros. Yes, and so the kind of thing you immediately hope is that I get this picture, is that the image curve, phi of c, is a, a quartic curve. So you hope that phi k of c, that phi k c is an isomorphism from c isomorphic to c4 in p2. Yes? And then uh, isomorphic, so this will be a non singular curve. Yes, and a non singular curve in P2 does have genus 3, and so we're very happy. And uh, so the, the positive thing we've gained from, it, from this, I start off with C, which is an abstractly given algebraic curve for genus 3, or if you like, uh, for other people, it will be a complex is a Riemann surface, <coughs> compact Riemann surface of genus 3. So that's a, a, an object of abstract mathematics. And here I've got something which is in P2, and it's given by a completely explicit equation. Yes, and then we can start talking about not just one curve, but how many curves there are. If I vary the coefficients, now this might be, if you just want one example, it might be x0 to the fourth plus x1 to the fourth plus x2 to the fourth, and then plus other terms. Yeah? So if I'm only interested in proving that at least one of these guys exists, then it's enough to write down one equation. If I want to know the totality of all of them, then, you know, there are 15 coefficients here altogether. And maybe I have to worry about what happens when I change coordinates and so on. Yes? So uh, let, let, let me look at uh, what, this, what this hope is. So I can, I want to write down the ring, the graded ring I want to write down is the ring of C and KC. So this is the direct sum n greater than or equal to zero of h naught of c n k c. Yes, or, you know, I mean, when you do a first course on Riemann Rock, which you can do sort of to first year master's students or even to final year undergraduates, you write down the Riemann Rock space. This is historically what happens something called a canonical divisor, which is a divisor of degree 4, and I'm taking n times that, so this is a divisor of degree 4 times n, and then I get this. So in this case, the Riemann-Roch theorem says that the dimension of this h naught, which I'm going to write h naught of nkc, is... <coughs> So if you're in degrees, if n is zero, I'm asking for the Riemann-Roch space of the zero divisor. So I get the constants, I, and the, I only get the constant function, so I get one there. I'm going to explain this. Here I get in n equals zero, n equals one, I get three. That's just the definition of the genus. Yes, and then... Uh, in all, all dimensions higher than that, 
I get uh, um, 2n minus 1g. Yes, or, or uh, you know, if you, uh, 1 minus g plus n times the way of kc. Yes, so let's, I want to think of this, uh, the, these, each of these individually is a vector space, but I want to put them to the, all together as a ring. And so if I look at this ring, it has R1 is the vector space x0, x1, x2. And then who's R2? So R2 has dimension. Uh, you can all calculate this, g is 3. What, what, what am I saying? Have I done this calculation right? I'm sorry, there are some bizarre things uh, happening. I'm sorry, g minus 1. Uh, sorry about that, but, uh, you know, I'm used to lecturing to undergraduates and uh, undergraduates never correct the uh, professor's uh, stupid mistakes. <coughs> yes, and so uh, uh, Riemann Rock says this is six-dimensional and <coughs> So, you know, something that's uh, an important point is here, we already own elements, lots of elements. Right. So namely, we, uh, we, we, we own x0 squared, x0 x1, x1 squared, x0, x0, x2, x1, x2, and x2 squared. Okay. So I'm drawing these as a Newton polygon, <coughs> out of long habit, right? And uh, if I need to refer to all of these together, I'm writing S2 of the x. S2 is symmetric square of the, of the representation uh, with basis x0, x1, x2. Yes? And so I've got a six-dimensional vector space and I've got six elements in it, so obviously they form a basis. Yes? So uh, the hope is they form a basis. Right. So, uh, you know, in research mathematics, if you're trying to prove something, it's very often to, useful to assume the contrary and try to construct a counterexample. So if you fail to construct a counterexample, maybe you find a proof, and conversely. So uh, if it goes wrong, if it fails, <coughs> it means that some... Q2 of x is at zero as section of 2k. Yes? Or, in other words, it means, so, you know, if I pull back OP1, OP2, if I pull back OP2 of 2, then I get OC of 2k. And so I've got six sections here. And so saying, saying that these guys here are zero means that they vanish on the image. So this means i.e. q2 of x is identically zero on phi kc of c. Yeah? So in other words, the image, 
So this picture is not correct. What's happening is here is P2, and here is the image. It's contained in uh, the image is contained in a conic of C. It's contained in a conic. Yes. But, uh, you know, the, I still had this business about the degree being 4, yes? So if I take a general line in P2, it will meet the conic in two points, and then when I pull, back, pull that back to the, to the curve, I'm supposed to have a, degree, a device of degree 4. And so in this case, what happens is that the curve maps 2 to 1 to a quadratic in P2. Yes. So these are called hyperelliptic, right? Uh, if I take, if I think of this conic as being isomorphic to P1, yes, then this, uh, uh, the, the map to P1 is something called a G12. It's a linear system of degree 2 that moves in a, so this is uh, a divisor that moves around that's in one half of the canonical class. Yes? So, um, uh, also in this case, so uh, I, I can continue R3, so this is S3 of these exercises, to minus relations plus new elements. Yes? So here, uh, here, these, if these guys in R2, if there's a relation, then there must be a new element. Yes, and so, so what happens here is that, uh, uh, so let me, uh, let, let me not spend too much time on this now. Uh, I said that if it happens, if these things are not linearly independent, then there is a, a conic in the plane, right? So I'm asserting here that there is only one conic in the plane. It can only be one. These things must be at least five-dimensional. I'm also assuming that if there is a conic, it's non-singular. Yes? And so the proof of these things are... Uh, to do with the geometry of C. The C was an irreducible curve. If its image is a line pair, then you work through it and find that the curve had to be irreducible. If there are two conics, then some conic in that pencil must be irreducible, and the same argument gives a contradiction. Yes? So, uh, <coughs> and then, so, uh, this S3 is 10 monomials. Uh, so if there are no relations, so if the, the result, let, let me not worry about how to, the proof, because it's not difficult. The result, if non-hyperelliptic, in other words, if this hope is true, then R of C, K, C, is polynomial range x0, x1, x2, divided by f4. Yeah, so in other words, continuing this on, r4, I'd find, r4, I'd find 15 monomials in the xi's, and this calculation still tells us that it's 7 times 2. So I definitely find the quartic relation there, and that's the only relation in this ring or, if hyperelliptic, then R C of K C is K of X0, X1, X2. So these don't generate, these don't form a basis for the two-dimensional guy, so I have to put in one new generator. So the new basis element is going to be called Y. I put in an element Y here. And then I have to divide out by the relations. 
So one of the relations was this Q2, right? And then there's a second relation, which is Y2, Y, y squared equals A <coughs> for of Xi. Uh, of the x's, yes. And so th this is telling us that the, the hyperelliptic curve is C maps to P1 embedded in as a quadrate in P2, yes. And this map here is 2 to 1 branched in this A4 intersect Q2. Yes. So, the, so, you know, this is the whole theory of curves of genus 3. Yes. And so, you know, the Q2 has coefficients and the Xi's and, the, and the, this quartic polynomial have Xi's. The coefficients they depend on are the coefficients of this, eight points, right? And if I put a co if I put a lambda here, yes, when lambda is non, when lambda is zero, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If I put lambda y plus q two there, it allows me to have lambda equals zero, giving the hyperelliptic guys and lambda not zero. And so, uh, so this hyperelliptic case, in this hyperelliptic case, I get C is contained in P of 1, 1, 1, 2. So this is the cone on the Veronese surface. Right. And inside this cone, it's, uh, it's defined by Q2 equals A4 equals 0. This is a co-dimension 2 complete intersection. I can vary the coefficients. I can allow the Q2 to be a hyperplane passing through the vertex, in which case I get the hyperelliptic case. OK, so this was an illustration. Right, I start off with an abstract curve of genus 3. So this is, not, uh, think of this as an object of abstract mathematics. And at the end, I get a completely concrete result saying either the curve is a plane curve to A4, or there's this kind of little degenerate situation, degeneracy happening, I think, in, in co-dimension 1. It's just a matter of this one coefficient might happen to be zero, and then, uh, and then we uh, get the hyperelliptic case. So in either case, we win something. In either case, we win a, a concrete model. Yes? So uh, let, me, let me give very briefly a, a kind of much earlier example of this. So example two, this is called Weierstrass normal form. So now I take a curve of genus 1 and p in a point, and I look at r of e p. So this is the direct sum of Riemann-Roch spaces n p. Yeah, and so this is rational functions with pole less than me. Yes. And so then I'm just going to tell you that Riemann Rock Riemann Rock says this has dimension this vector this vector space has dimension one if n equals zero, one if n equals one. And then it's uh, n if 
and it's twice a night. Yes, and so what, what, what happens here is that uh, when n is zero, I just have OE. And the, uh, the Riemann Roth space here are just the constant functions on, on OE. So H naught is just C. Constant functions. N equals one. So the line bundle is this, OE of P. So I'm asking for I'm asking for rational functions on on E, and they're allowed to have a single pole at the point P. Yes, and so you think, well, maybe maybe I, I get the chance of finding a non-trivial function there, right? However, OE is isomorphic to omega E, and then omega E of P would be a holomorphic one form with a single pole at a point P. And uh, you can, so you can calculate the residue in two different ways. On the one hand, the residue must be non-zero because there's a pole at P. On the other hand, the residue must be zero because it's the same as the residue on the rest. And uh, so it turns out that this is also one-dimensional. And we know very well who the section it is here. Namely, the section is OC contained in OC of E. Yes? And so I, I allow rational functions to have a pole, but it turns out that when I write H0, this just gives equality. So in other words, this guy here, although I allow, allowed him in theory, I allow him, in theory, to have a pole at P. In fact, globally, he can't do it. Yes? And so I'm going to write x here. So 1 in R0 is a basis, and x in R1 is a basis. Yeah? And so this, this thing here is a direct sum. <coughs> In degree 1, I get this R0. In degree 1, I also get this is the constant function. Right? The, this is just x is the constant function, but I give him a different name because he's in a different vector space. Right? And so now, from then on, it sort of gets easier. So if our n is 2, I look at OE of 2p, and here I've got one, I only own one element, namely x squared. Right? But this is a two-dimensional, the x naught of this is two-dimensional, and so there's a new element y. Yes? And this y is the Weierstrass p function. Yes? And so, uh, you know, if we're doing uh, complex analysis and we're trying to find doubly periodic functions, then you have to allow, the first time you get one is when you allow pole of order 2 at the origin, and you get this complicated formula that Weierstrass wrote down, Some most of you will have seen, um, and then n, n is 3, and so on. So uh, I get x cubed, x, y, and I get a z. And z up to proportionality is p prime, right? And then we get a sextic equation uh, y squared equals, sorry, z squared equals y cubed plus a y plus b. Yes, and so this is uh, uh, and so uh, when I when I start using this seriously, this will be will anybody like to sacrifice a scarf or a, some other garment for me to wipe the board?
Thanks very much. Thank you. It's pretty, yeah. Uh, no, uh, well, I was thinking of uh, this uh, first. Yeah. When I was first a graduate student at the ITS, uh, I went to a lecture at Pierre de Ligne, and because I was just a graduate student, I offered to write the board for him, and he said, no, 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 no. Wiping the board is when I think. <laughs> So uh, um, the, the, the result here, I haven't, I'm, I'm going to explain this in a great deal more detail. Later, I get A is equal to A hypersurface of degree 6 in weighted projective space, 1, 2, 3. Right. So I have x, y, and z. <coughs> So in degree one, I get only this guy x, which is just a sort of name for the trivial function. Whereas here, I'm doing uh, when I'm doing x in degree two, I'm getting a new function, a genuine new function. And here, I start having to do algebra with these functions. When I get to degree seven, I find that I've got seven monomials in a six-dimensional space. And so there must be an equation, and I can arrange for the equation to have these leading terms. Yes. And so, uh, you know, I'm going to draw a picture of proj of x, y, z. Well, I'm going to be doing this uh, more systematically later. But what this is, is a kind of bag like this. So there's a point P of y, so this is the point 0, 1, 0, and this is the point pz, this is 0, 0, 1. Uh, so here, everywhere here, x is non-zero. Yes, and so this is just a2 with coordinates y over x squared and z over x cubed. Right? So proj on a pro the functions on a proj are things like this. Ratios of homogeneous polynomials of the same degree. <coughs> yes. Whereas here I have to do uh, x divided by the square root of y and z divided by the square root of y cubed. Right. So it's a2 like that divided by z mod 2. Right. So in other words, in order to find homogeneous ratios at this point, first of all, I have to take the square root of y. Yes, And then I can write down these expressions. And then, well, I did something, I did something that was not Fun actual functions, this is a Galois extension uh, by taking the square root of something, and so I have to quotient back out by this group action. So this is an ordinary double point, a half of 1, 1. Right, and something similar here, I'm getting a third of 1, 2. So uh, uh, this thing here, this thing here is a uh, Weighted projective space, it's the simplest weighted projective space. Uh, you can think of it, if you want to, as a del pezzo surface with singularities. So this is a singularity of type A1, and this is a singularity of type A2. Yes? So it's a toric variety, it's a very harmless variety in... Uh, other parts of mathematics, you don't want to think of this as a singularity at all. You want to think of it as a, an orbifold or a delinu mumford stack. <coughs> yes? And so, uh, uh, you know, the, this is weighted projective space, so it's C3 with coordinates x, y, z, where I delete the origin. And then I divide out by C star, acting with these weights. 
Yes? And when I'm at, um, I'll describe this in more detail, if I'm at, along the y-axis, then in order to divide by the C star action, I have to do this maneuver, right? And so, you know, there's a, there's a little thing which you might want to call a singularity or you might want to call an orbifold point. <clears throat> and it's just because the group action here is sort of a little bit funny along the y-axis. Along the y-axis, there's a group in here, namely the group plus or minus one, which acts trivially on the y-axis, but which acts non-trivially on points outside the y-axis. Yes. So this uh, curve here is P1, 2, 3, and so it is, as a scheme, it's isomorphic to P1 with coordinates uh, y squared z cubed, y cubed z squared. Yes, because if I've only got y, y and z and I want to build a homogeneous ratio, I have no choice at all. It has to be a, a, a function of only those monomials. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, I'll get into this in much more detail. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give, uh, and I realize uh, time management is not necessarily my strongest skill. I want to talk about what Riemann Rockland curves really is and how you prove it. And I want to do it in half an hour. So I'm going to start now. So Riemann Rock on curves. Yes, very good, very good. So uh, the curve here is given by where x is not zero, it's just given by this equation with x set equal one. Yes? And here it passes through this point. So this was the original P on the curve, right? So uh, if you think of this, if you take the coarse quotient scheme, the coarse scheme, then this is just a copy of P1, and this is just uh, a curve that meets uh, a, a curve that meets it transversely in a single point. Yes, that's the origin, and so you know. On the other hand, if I want to think of this as a, sort of a scheme theoretic quotient, I have something like this. Upstairs I have y squared equals x cubed, and then I've divided this by a group action so that y, sorry, y cubed equals z squared, y cubed equals, z squared equals y cubed, so this is, you know, a, 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 you've got perfect right to think of this variety as being singular, and then I'm mapping this down to the coarse scheme quotient, so this is an orbi cusp, and uh, this is something which you probably won't find in the literature. It's uh, a kind of little problem in all kinds of um, theoretical treatments, yes? So we'll, we'll have another kind, uh, another couple of these kind of little paradoxes. Uh, you know, the curve can... Uh, so so let, me, let me come to that when it, when it comes up. So I want to talk about riemann rock curves. And a question related, so in, in projective space you have the lines. Lines. Yes. Here in weighted projective space, what do you have and what's the degree of the or multi degree of the curve? Yes. Can you can one? So, uh, uh, you know, if I, 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 I'm going to do more complicated versions of this, but uh, so in P1, P1, 2, 3, I can write down a curve of degree n, any n. Right? So if n is 1, I get this line P123, yes? And so, you know, you can 
if you're a, if you're a classical algebraic geometer, you want to sort of blow this up to a minus two. Think of this as a curve and blow this up to two minus twos, right? And then there'll be the y-axis and the z-axis of uh, y equals zero and z sorry z equals zero. Y equals zero will be there, and they meet transversely in one point. So the, all of this locus is non-singular; it's just a two. It's just uh, affine two space with these coordinates. And then uh, you know you have to worry about what this intersection number. Is. So this will be probably minus one, or it might be. And then these will also have some uh, intersection number, right? So uh, <clears throat> if I write C two. Uh, you know, uh, it's sort of probably more interesting to think about what C7. Yes, so C7 will certainly pass through both of those points, and if we're lucky, it'll pass through that non singularly, and maybe it passes through this also non singularly because there's a one there. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, you can study these by taking the course scheme quotients and then resolving the singularities, or you can take them by taking this little orbifold cover by introducing these things. And you know, there are two different methods of studying it. So we're going to see this again and again. So uh, here I'm doing this as uh, you know, an illustration of what Weierstrass did in uh, 1850, <coughs> uh, <coughs> but, uh, and you know, the, this is sort of gratuitous. We don't really, I don't really need to spend half an hour talking about a single point on a non-singular curve with a, fun with a pole of order two and a pole of order three. Yes? However, when you're in higher dimensions, especially when you go to three folds, this is the whole meat of algebraic geometry. This is why algebraic geometry in dimension three and above always involves uh, orbifolds or singularities. I'm going, uh, you know, that's one of the main themes of the lectures this week. Okay, so let me, let me go back down to completely basic things. I want to talk about riemann roch and its correct statement and its correct Proof. And I believe the proof I'm going to give is new. I'm going to run through most of the definitions and so on in the statement because you already know it. Yes? So algebraic geometry is about polynomials and rings. Yes, so uh, a curve C is union CI, and each CI is spec of some C of CI, and this is called an affine coordinate ring. Yes. So if C, a projective curve, C is, uh, so, uh, you know, let me say in Pn, right, is C is crudge of a ring R, right, and the ring is uh, C homog homogeneous <coughs> of C R, of C. Yes, and you get the affine pieces in the usual way. Think of Pn, take Xi not equal zero. So implicitly what I was doing here. Yes, uh, so there's an affine coordinate ring, there's a homogeneous coordinate ring. Right? For every point P in C, there's a local ring. OCP. Yes, and so... Uh, uh, you know how to construct it from here. You take affine coordinate rings and then you take rational functions here where the denominator is regular at P. Yeah? So this is a localization 
of C, C R. Right, and non-singular curve, this is almost by definition, is if and only if OCP is a discrete valuation. Right, so uh, uh, a lot of students come to algebraic geometry from complex function theory, so complex function theory, a, a curve is a Riemann surface, and at a Riemann surface, I can, at any point of a Riemann surface, I can take a coordinate little z, and then uh, a meromorphic function in z has a degree of pole, and uh, uh, has a pole and a, or a degree of zero, and that is this discrete valuation rate. So this means that I, every, every uh, f in the function field of C, so that's the field of fractions of this ring, or it's the field of fractions of this ring in degree zero, uh, has, is, uniquely, uh, is, f is, z to the power of n p times u, a unit. Yes? So the whole of, al the whole of algebraic, th these are things that everybody has already seen. Yes? So if you do algebraic geometry, you've seen these rings, you've seen these constructions. I'm going to talk about proj in a lot more detail tomorrow. Yes, and you've seen uh, what it means for a function to have a zero or a pole at the point P. <coughs> so this is a local parameter, and this U is a unit, so it's not, uh, it's regular and non-zero at the point, so I can take it similar. Yes, okay, so, but there are many more rings. Yes, and so I'm going to take f in k of c, a rational function, non-constant, non and use it as a morphism c to p1. Yeah, and so, you know, this is also Riemann's point of view. Riemann defined uh, a Riemann surface as a covering of the complex plane. So this is P1, C. So it's, you know, the ordinary complex plane together with a single point at infinity if you want to take that point of view. And here's my curve C, it looks like this. <coughs> yes, and so F has a divisor, which is the zeros of F minus the poles of f. Right? So zeros of f means that means sigma n p p, where n is greater than zero. Right? And this is uh, sigma n p p. Yes? And uh, so Here's zero and here's infinity, and so here are the zeros and here are the poles. Yes? And so I can take I can take <coughs> C of uh, X. So this is the affine coordinate ring of P1, where x is not in infinity. Yes, and so this is a ring whose ring of fractions is C of F, and C of C is an algebraic extension, and I can take Integral closure 
of C of X in C of C. Yes? So this is the same, the ring of integers in number theory. <coughs> okay, so uh, maybe, maybe we leave this. Maybe, maybe I stop here. So the, the, the point I'm making here is that if you want to do algebraic geometry on the curve, you will at one point or another mention many, many different rings. Right? And I want to tell you one ring that I particularly love, uh, <clears throat> which is not any of the ones written here, and uh, where the, the proof of Riemann-Roch comes very, very simply as an essentially trivial result. So the uh, agreement was that I will give, have a break for one hour, and uh, we start again at 11. But tomorrow and the next day, we have to. We can only have a half hour break. It's okay. So, the uh, uh, students in the audience and professors in the audience, all at completely different levels. So, uh, if you have questions, please let me know. I can, if, if I can't answer the question during a lecture, I can, uh, I can at least give you reference to literature.